Joining me now is the lead defense attorney for Cain Velasquez, uh, Mark Garrigus. Mark, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. Um, I just, a lot's happened recently, obviously, in, in the Cain case. We've been following it pretty closely. And I want to start with the, uh, the bail. I feel like that was a, a big win for you guys. Um, talk to me about that process, um, asking for it again. I feel like we sat through a lot of those hearings and heard you ask over and over again. Why did you keep asking? What did you feel like was missing or, or, or maybe perhaps the judge was missing? Well, look, the, the, the law in California is that the first judge that deals with the bail, unless there's a change of circumstance, you have to keep going back. And uh, unfortunately, she had apparently made up her mind and we could not convince her that there was a change of circumstance, even though it was apparent from the beginning of the case that uh, early on we discovered they were no longer going to call this the so-called victim, Mr. Goularte. And... Uh, once that happened, that was the only count where Kane was facing life. So we kept going back three times. We went up to the Court of Appeal and finally made the decision we're going to do the preliminary hearing. And the preliminary hearing in California, for those who don't know, is a probable cause proceeding, a very low standard. And the judge hears the evidence. And California's also got one other peculiarity in that you don't have to put the witnesses on, you can put hearsay on. So that's what the district attorney did. They didn't want to put on uh, Galarte. They didn't want to put on the stepfather who was in the car or his mother who ran the preschool. So they put on, I believe, five different officers. We were able to cross-examine them. It became apparent after the hearing, at least in my opinion, that now there was a change of circumstance. Now a judge had actually heard derivatively the hearsay evidence, and we thought that was enough to uh, for him to be released. And sure enough, the judge agreed. Yeah, and you guys were right. And I noticed, um, you know, I was watching on the stream online, and it seemed like when the judge went to uh, kind of took a recess to, to go over his and make his decision, it seemed like you guys maybe knew that things were going to go your way. You guys were laughing, kind of smiling. Can you talk about the relief maybe, you know, from you, but also from Kane? Like you, you knew him throughout this when he was incarcerated. You knew the kind of emotional toll. So what kind of relief is that? Like the before and after? Can you just talk about that? Well, I think anybody who's got kids or grandkids um, can empathize with the idea of here you've got a man who's charged with the serious crimes, Kane. Uh, but at the same time, you've got a, a victim here, which is a relative of his, and there needed to be some healing. And I thought that the preliminary hearing went about as well for us as it could have. I, I could I could second guess myself on, on various things, but given the totality of the circumstances, I just thought that it was apparent that this was a man who needed to be home with his family and to let the healing begin. And he'd already done I forget how many I, I knew at the time. Uh, it shows you I'm having a senior moment, but I, I think he'd done 243 days or 253 days in tr in actual custody. And clearly, um, I uh, I think that's enough time. He need to be home and and with the family, as I said, in healing. Yeah, and I know that obviously that's that's a. I'm sure you guys were thrilled with the way that that went, but there's there's bigger victories to be had for you. A lot of people I talk to that even support Kane, you know, they say it's great that he's freed now. You know, that was a, a big feather in his cap. But they seem to have skepticism about the the ultimate freedom down the line. What would you say to those people? And, and what is kind of your, your perspective? I'm not, I'm not going to prognosticate anything. I will say that the judge who heard the hearsay evidence and by the way, the previous judge who had denied him bail both had the same um, reaction. He has a viable defense. And so those are magic words in the criminal law. A viable defense means that you can present the evidence, you could get presumably jury instructions, and you can let jurors decide whether or not um, this, uh, a reasonable person would have acted this way. And when you look at the charges, do you feel like that this is a, a tall task that you guys are in for quite a fight here? Or do you think that when you break it down, do you feel like that there's um, you know, some, some sort of, uh, it, maybe it's not what people think? Well, they, look, the, no matter what you say or do, the criminal justice system is generally tilted way in to, towards the prosecution. So uh, it's always an uphill battle. I, I don't diminish that. 
Yeah. And obviously, too, I thought it was very interesting that the first time when Shalina Brown was was hearing your your bail requests, she kind of made it sound like, you know, this isn't the court of public opinion. This is, you know, people can can like Kane and, and put him up on a pedestal. But I can't think about those things. And I thought it was interesting that the judge uh, Bocanegra kind of said the opposite. That was part of the reason he gave bail. So how important, not necessarily emotionally or, or you know, mentally for Kane, is it to have that support, but also kind of legally for you guys, too? I think for Kane, and, you know, I, I hesitate to ever speak for him, um, except in the legal context, but I think it's obvious that he that he wants a message out there. He wants the truth out there, and the truth is what he's seeking, and I think if he tells the truth, I, we're confident uh, that things will work out. And can you kind of maybe explain a little bit, um, people hear that phrase, the heat of passion. Can you just kind of, maybe, it's, it was thrown around quite a bit in, in those hearings for, for our fan base that maybe aren't, you know, legal experts, not everybody has their, their PhD here. Can you just kind of maybe just kind of give, give them a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, but I, I don't want to teach a law school class, but basically <laughs> the difference between, first of all, you have what's called a homicide. And a homicide is the killing at the hands of another, basically. And if you have a homicide plus the mental state of malice, that makes it a murder. If you negate the malice, then you go down to a manslaughter. If you've got a defense or justification, it can be an invol or it can be a complete acquittal. He's charged with, not with murder because nobody was murdered, but with an attempted murder. The heat of passion comes in to negate the malice element. If you negate the malice element, it is not a, an attempted murder. And that's why both judges have commented that he's got a viable defense here because there is a heat of passion uh, defense and the heat of passion defense and the jury instructions are such that, uh, that both both judicial officers commented that he's got a viable uh, defense to the, the accusations. And by the way, um, uh, wouldn't surprise me in the least, uh, I've tried a, uh, or our office has tried a case in that county before, not identical circumstances, but similar, and uh, and that resulted in an acquittal. Yeah, and I think that where you guys kind of deviated perhaps from the district attorney was kind of the premeditated aspect. That was something that was focused on. So would you say from all the evidence that you've had and what we've seen so far, that that's something that you guys will, will be key to your argument going forward? I'm not going to make any predictions or give the prosecution any more hints than they already have. <laughs> They sat through the prelim. They can. They're big. He, uh, Mr. French is a big boy. He can. Uh, he can figure it out. Gotcha. And also, the obviously another difference between the the Shalina Brown hearings and the the Bulk Negra ones was, um, you know, the fact that the Galart case. How much does it play into what came? You know, what what uh what was going on with Kane and in, in his case. So, um, there's if you look at the two cases right now, he is a couple months. He's got his pretrial hearing, I believe, in January. Um, is the is the timing of this, is that any sort of game, so to speak? You know, I hear some people say that a conviction on, you know, Harry's getting convicted would play into your hand, and that's what they're trying to prevent. So do you view it that way? Is it any sort of timing race or anything like that? I don't know. I've, I've always, I've said before, I won't look prospectively. I'll just comment on what's happened. I've always had the distinct impression that it's a inherent conflict of interest for the same prosecutor to be prosecuting Harry Galarte, the prosecution office, prosecuting Harry Galarte and prosecuting Kane. I mean, that's inherently a tension that I don't think they can overcome. And I know you had hinted at this previously, but we heard it for the first time um, when the police officers were talking in the last hearing about Kane telling them that there were other children out there and that, you know, that there, his son wasn't the only victim. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Is there any sort of other legal ramifications that are going to come, other sorts of, of charges or anything? No, I, uh, I'll let the evidence speak for itself. Okay. And so I guess, can you just kind of explain what happens from here? You guys are due back in court, I believe, December 28th. It's, um, he's going to, he's going to, uh, claim his counsel or, or state who his counsel is? Is that kind of what happens? Well, there's, the, there's discussions on the, of that and counsel and who will, who will be counsel going forward. And there's, you know, as you as you may or may not know, um, he's released on a monitor and, um, and 
you know, the fir- foremost concern, I think, of everybody involved, at least from my standpoint, even though um, the uh, the future, you know, who knows what the future holds is to spend time with his family. I mean, it's been, this has been a rough go. I don't, I, I don't underestimate that at all. Yeah. And one other aspect I want to touch on is the uh, the pro wrestling endeavor that he's doing. I think that caught a lot of people off guard. Um, is this a, some sort of thing that we can expect him to do from here on out? Like, you know, guys got to make a living now that he's out. Is this setting uh, a precedent? I, 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 you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Everybody's got to make a living, and I'll defer to his manager for that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hopefully a one-off on uh, representing Kane. And last question, is there any sort of timeline, again, that you can give for, like, when we should expect to see a trial happen? Like, are you concerned at all about trying to find jurors for this? Like, I know that's something everybody always talks about. Like, how are you going to find somebody in the area that doesn't know what's going on? Like, is this some sort of thing that we're looking at? you know, taking a, a significant period of time to get rolling? I, the, you know, the, all, all I can tell you that's somewhat, uh, I think, endemic to the criminal justice system in California, uh, the courts are so backlogged post-COVID that uh, they are doing triage right now. In fact, I don't know if, if you were watching the live stream before we got sent out, uh, the uh, master, what I would call the master calendar judge, did about a 20 minute um, monologue on basically why the speedy trial rights uh, had to be suspended because of the crush of cases. So who knows, he's now out. So he goes kind of uh, behind the line of people who are still in. Yeah, well, we'll we'll get through the holidays. Mark, I appreciate your time. Um, Thanks for joining me and, and we'll hopefully be talking again in the future. I hope so too, thank you.